Everybody said. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the gospel. And thank you for the call you're giving us to come into the faith and to abide in the faith. We pray that the grace to abide with Christ, in Christ, until glory, you give to everyone in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that once again you open the spiritual eyes of everyone, that will behold the truth that you have reserved for us in your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3. We've been studying from chapter 1. And now we're in verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be is everyone that hangeth on a tree. In verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Those two verses introduce us to what we're looking at tonight. As we look at the Bible, we have different dispensations and different eras. From Genesis to Exodus chapter 2, you have the era or the period of the conscience. They lived by their conscience. The law had not been written. The law had not been given to them. But the Lord implanted in their hearts, in their conscience, what is right to be done. And then from Exodus chapter 2, when Moses was born, until the end of the Old Testament, you have the era of the law. And the law was given to them. The Ten Commandments were written on the tables of stone. But then the other laws like ceremonial laws and social laws and their relationship with each other based on the written law given to them. Everything was spelled out. There was nothing left for guessing or for imagination. This do and thou shalt live. This if you don't do, then you will die. The soul that sinneth it shall die. And then Christ came. And when he came, he brought not the law of Moses. He actually came to fulfill the law of Moses. And after fulfilling that law, he now brings us into the kingdom by faith. And that gives us the gospel, gives us the grace of God, and grace and faith walk godliness in our lives and so it is no more the law but faith and faith deals with the promises of God but the children of Israel did not know did not understand when to come out of the law and to come into the promises of God by faith that the reason they had much much problem or the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. They were always looking back to the law. And Christ was bringing them to faith. He was telling them that now a new era, a new period, a new dispensation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Behold the Lamb of God. No more the Lamb on the altars of the Jewish sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus the Messiah 
Jesus the righteous, Jesus the redeemer came that he, not the lamb, not the animal, but he, Christ, is the one to save us from sin. And the promise is whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And where to come with that promise, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call by believing. The promise of God, by having faith in the provision of God, we come into the kingdom and we come to Christ. And that is what transforms our lives. That whosoever be in Christ is a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Character becomes new. Lifestyle becomes new and the disposition we have, everything becomes new because, not because we are in Genesis, the time of conscience, not because we are in Exodus chapter 20, all through to Malachi, the time of the Lord, but because we are now in the dispensation of grace and the grace of God works in our lives. And we are now told it is as we have that faith in the promise of the Lord, we come to the blessing of Abraham, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, not only Jews who are the law, but on the Gentiles. And then it says, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise the promise of the spirit through faith faith in christ that's why tonight we're looking at this passage in galatians chapter 3 verses 13 to 29 i was looking at the superiority of the promise of faith the superiority now when you say superiority you are comparing two things that this one is higher than the other the superiority of the promise of faith above beyond the law of Moses three things we're looking at in the passage number one the promise of the spirit through faith the promise of the spirit there's no restriction here to the Jews or to the Gentiles. The Spirit of God coming to everyone, alerting everyone, teaching everyone, bringing everyone out of what is past and bringing us to the very presence of God. And we have the promise of the Spirit and we claim the promise by faith. Number two, the prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment that the Lord had given the promise unto the seed, singular, not unto seeds as to the uh, different children in different generations of Abraham, but unto the siege. And that siege is Christ. And then we have the fulfillment as Christ has come. Number three is the purpose of the schoolmaster in focus. Let's come to number one. Number one, the promise of the Spirit through faith. We're coming to those two verses again. Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Christ has redeemed us. From the curse of the law. He has done it already. When he went to the cross. And when he died for us on the cross. And when he said. It is finished. He has redeemed us. From the curse of the law. He has redeemed us. From the condemnation of the law. He has redeemed us. From all the consequences. Of the broken law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cause said is everyone that hangeth on a tree and why did he do that for us verse 14 again it says that the blessing of abraham might come 
the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the promise of salvation through faith in Christ that we might receive the promise. What promise? The promise of salvation. Number two, the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration the lord himself made provision for everything number one for our salvation number two for our sanctification through faith the faith we have in him when we come to him and lay everything upon the altar and consecration number three the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in his commission all that we have in the promise of the spirit salvation promise in the of the spirit sanctification through faith and consecration and power the power of the holy ghost the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in the commission let's look at number one number one is the promise of salvation through faith in christ look at romans chapter 10 reading from verse 8 in romans chapter 10 verse 8 but what says each the word is nice thee even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith which we preach for anyone to have salvation we must hear of christ as savior we must know the promise of christ our savior we must know how the process how to come into that salvation there are preachers who preach salvation but they'll spend 90 percent of the time talking about the law, talking about sin, talking about the evil in the world. And then they spend maybe about five minutes and talk about faith. That's not a good proportion. We're talking about Christ. We're talking about faith. We talk about the process by which the people come to the Lord. But if we preach sin, 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 condemnation and guilt and the condemnation and the damnation and we spend all the time and then in person we just say okay Christ can save you come to the Lord now that's not the that's not how to pre present salvation what says he the word is near thee even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith we need to make the sinners know that salvation is available now and that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We need to make them understand even if their tears were flowing, even if they're rolling on the ground, even if they felt sorry for their sin, all that is not enough. The word of faith which were preached, look at verse 9, in verse 9, that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, a sinner may confess sin every day of the year and confess and confess and come back again. I remember another one confess and for confess. That's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying if you confess Christ, as savior as redeemer as the messiah if you confess christ as the one that links you up with the heavenly father he is a redeemer he's done the work already that he that shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you see the mistakes of many they confess sin they don't confess christ the savior 
the Redeemer, the one who has died for us, they have conviction about their sin, about their guilt, about their condemnation. They do not have conviction about the Christ who died and about the Christ who was nailed to the cross and who took away all our sin. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, For what the heart man believeth unto righteousness, not by struggling, not by trying, not by turning over a new leaf, the way we have righteousness, but what the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and what the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And look at that in verse 13 now. Verse 13 says, For whosoever whosoever those who have been deep in sin high in sin those who have gone far in sin for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved you know there are some people that even wonder all these crusades we are having and then we say you want to receive the Lord as your personal Savior, stand up there and raise up your hand. And then we say, come to Christ. And they don't cry. They don't roll on the ground. They don't feel sorry. They don't bring the remembrance of all the sins they committed from when they were very young until this time. They just stand up there and they say, yes, Lord, I give you my heart and I confess that now you are my Savior. And then the preacher assures them, you have called upon the name of the Lord. You are saved. You are born again. Because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Lord shall be saved. And some people say, uh, is that salvation? Can people get saved like that? Thank God for the testimonies we are hearing. The people that their lives have been transformed and righteousness came into their lives because they confess Christ is now my Savior. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. I have the joy of salvation. I have the victory in salvation. I have called and the word says and I believe it whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved let's come to first Peter chapter 1 verse 5 who are kept by the power of God we're saved and in that salvation we're kept by the power of God and God has no power to keep everyone that has genuinely come to the Lord. And we don't have to doubt, can this stand? Is it of any value? All these uh, things we're doing, uh, we're evangelizing, we're going out, and they say they have believed. Is it of any value? Of course, yes. Are they kept? Yes. Who keeps them? God, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time i pray that as we faithfully present the word of god the people will receive receive christ believe christ they'll be saved in jesus name look at number two here number two the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 25 Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it the church is the ecclesia the church the people that are called out of sin called out of society called out of evil, called out of the world of wickedness. That's the church. Because they were called and they came out and they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are the church. Now Christ gave himself for the church. Why? Verse 20 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it that she might sanctify and cleanse it. Some people have little understanding about that word sanctify. And so God brings the next word to tell us what he means, cleanse. 
he sanctifies he cleanses some people say to be sanctified is only to be set apart it's only to be removed from there to here the salvation already when you believe on the lord jesus christ you are part of the ecclesia you are part of the church that is called out set apart but the sanctification that christ prayed about after the disciples had been saved and he assured them their names were written in heaven he now prayed and he said father sanctify them cleanse them purge them purify them make them holy that he might sanctify and cleanse it sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth sanctification is inward cleansing the cleansing of the heart the cleansing of the spirit the cleansing of our mind the cleansing of our thoughts that inwardly and outwardly outwardly saved all the external sins are taken away inwardly in our heart in our spirit in our soul we're now sanctified and cleansed it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look at verse 26, 27. The consequence of that sanctification. It says that he might present each the church unto himself. A glorious church, not having spot. That's what the sanctifying and the cleansing will do not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy that's what sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word that's what it does that it should be holy and without blemish first thessalonians chapter 5 Reading from verse 22. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. That now you are born again. You are saved. You don't have any interest in evil anymore. You don't have, have any attraction to evil anymore. The evil of the world and the evil of the carnal nature does not attract you, interest you anymore. There is no magnetic field, magnetic current between you and evil anymore. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. After that, verse 23. In verse 23, and the very God of peace, the God of peace who had given you peace at salvation, the God of peace who had taken away the condemnation and the guilt and the confusion and the fear of eternal judgment, that God of peace now sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he will do it. I said he will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people. Jesus also, also is Savior. He saved us. But then, uh, that is not the end. Also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, the same blood that forgave us, that changed us, that redeemed us, 
the same blood that is shed on the cross of Calvary that saves us. That same blood is the blood that sanctifies us. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the gate. Look at verse 13. It says, let us go forth therefore for that sanctification to be ours although he has shed his blood we have to go forth unto him without the calm bearing his reproach verse 14 says for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come acts chapter 15 verse 9 and he put no difference between us and them between us Jews and them Gentiles God put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith purifying their hearts by faith that's how we get sanctification that's how we get the purifying of the heart by faith. Let's look at number three here. Number three is the power of the Spirit for fruitfulness in His commission. It tells us in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Remember, remember that the promise of the Spirit it's what we receive as we come to the Lord. Salvation, sanctification, and the power, immersion, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I set the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry him in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Tarry tarry in prayer tarry in consecration tarry in obedience to the lord tarry in making sure that there is no barrier between you and the fulfillment of the promise of god and you tarry in prayer you tarry by faith you tarry in total dependence on god until he be endued were power from on high. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4. I've been assembled together with them. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, here is the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, for ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Those who are going to witness in Jerusalem must have the power of the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Judea and minister in power must have the power, the immersion, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Samaria and they're going to witness effectively, they must have the power of the Holy Ghost. And those who are going to get to the uttermost part of the earth, to the end of the world, and to the people that live in the last hours of the last days of the dispensation, we must have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why it says we shall receive power after 
not before. We shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. And then we're witnesses unto the uttermost part of the earth. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 32. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. So also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. The Holy Ghost given to the believers who are saved, who are sanctified, and they obey the Lord in waiting, waiting for the Lord. The Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. Romans chapter 15. We're reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. That's what we receive when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, immersed in the Holy Ghost, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. We preach in the power of the Spirit. We're saved, we're sanctified, we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and we go in that power, reaching out to the world in the power of the Holy Ghost with the gospel of Christ. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, the prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 15. Brethren, I speak out of the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and the siege. What the promise is made, he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Then in verse 17, it says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, 430 years later, cannot disannul, cannot cancel, that it should make the promise of none effect. Then in verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, the inheritance we have, the heritage we have, the promise we have, the provision we have, if it be of the law, then it cannot be by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Then in verse 19, it says, Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgression till the siege does Christ till the siege till Christ shall come to whom the promise was made and was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator in verse 20 now a mediator is not a mediator of one but God is one verse 21 is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could give, could have given life, eternal life, 
Very little righteousness should have been by the Lord. Then in verse 22, it says, But the scripture has concluded all under sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith the promise by faith the promise by faith of jesus christ might be given to them them jew or gentile them everyone in the world might be given to them that believe that's the prophecy concerning the seed and the lord had prophesied that 430 years before the coming of the law, before the coming of the law of Moses, it was promised that it is through that seed that redemption will come, that blessing will come, that the benefits that God had promised will come on the whole of humanity. It is through the promise I will receive the fulfillment by faith, not by the law of Moses. The prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the identity of the siege, Christ. The identity of the siege, Christ. Number two, the inheritance through the siege, the confirmation. When Christ came, then the confirmation came. Number three, the interruption before the seed. The interruption before the seed. Before the seed will come. Before the conversion will come. Before the new life will come. Before Christ will enter in our lives. There will be conviction that I need him. Conviction. All I am, all I do, all I struggle for cannot achieve salvation. There'll be conviction that it is only Him and Him alone that can give me that salvation and that redemption. There'll be conviction. The interruption before the siege, conviction. Let's look at number one. Number one, the identity of the siege. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Would you know that when God was talking to Abraham back in Genesis? And he said, through thy seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through thy seed, all the families of the earth will be saved. Through thy seed, all the families of the earth will have the blessing of redemption. He was talking about Christ. Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And in thy seed, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In thy seed. The Holy Spirit, now through Paul the Apostle, tells us that seed is not Isaac, it's not Jacob, it's not the twelve patriots, it's Christ. That's the identity of the seed. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Ye, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed. You see that? 
It's through Christ we have conversion, redemption, salvation, eternal life. He said unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Verse 26 tells us about the seed now. Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, that's the seed. That's the one that came. That's the one that brings us salvation now. His son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquity. Christ has now come and he turns every one of you away from his iniquity. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, in verse 4. It says, and declare to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5 By whom we have received grace by that Christ, by the seed, by the Savior, the only Savior of the world, who have received grace and apostleship. For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Then in verse 6, among whom are ye also the cult of Jesus Christ. That's the seed. By him, through him, we are called into sonship, into the family of God. Let's look at number 2. Number two, the inheritance through the seed, the confirmation. We're coming back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Paul the Apostle always emphasizing that it is not by obedience to the law of Moses. It is by faith in Christ. Verse 17. In verse 17. And this I say. That the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law which was 430 years after later. Cannot disannul. That it should be made, it should make the promise of none effect. It was assuring the people that the law could not cancel the effect of the promise of God. That the, pro the law came much later, 430 years after the promise had been given. And that the promise is still standing. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. He gave it to Abraham by promise. And it wasn't for Abraham alone. It's for the rest of the world. It's for all the families of the earth as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17. Hebrews 6, 17. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise the immutability unchangeableness the permanence of his counsel confirmed each by an oath verse 18 it says in verse 18 
that by two immutable that by two immutable things in the which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation or a fledge for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us we have strong consolation because of the confirmation of the promise of God and we can lay hold on that promise without any shadow of doubt because God cannot lie it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will verse 12 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ everything is hinged on Christ becoming a believer a Christian, an heir of the promise of God, a saved soul, hinged on Christ, receiving the blessings of Abraham and being counted a member of the family of God with real conviction, confirmation, and assurance based on Christ, who first trusted in Christ. Verse 13. In verse 13, in whom ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed of that Holy Spirit of promise. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet suitable to be partakers of the inheritance. Made us fit, suitable, meet, to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13 was delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Verse 14, in whom we have, not future, we have, because he died for us, we have, because he paid the price, we have, because the promise made to the seed has now been confirmed we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin remember the moment you believe on Christ you have that inheritance you have the fulfillment of that promise and the spirit bears witness in your heart you're now a child of God there is a confirmation. Number three now. Number three, we're looking at Galatians chapter three. Reading from verse 19. It says, wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. This now came as an interruption to come in between in between the promise that had been given to Abraham and then the seed, the coming of the seed, something comes in between and it's the law that came in between the promise and then the provider, the fulfillment, the seed of that promise. Why was that added? Why did it come? Why the interruption of the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come. Till the seed should come. And once the seed has come, then the law of Moses will go out of the way. 
It was there in the interim. It was there as an interruption. But now Christ has come. Now the Redeemer has come. Till the sea shall come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. That is, that law was given through the mediation of the angels. We're coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. That was the problem of the children of Israel. They saw that the law of Moses was glorious, an angel ministered unto them, and then the face of Moses was shining, and they couldn't understand why that glorious scene will pass away, will be taken away. They didn't understand that something more glorious, the new covenant was now coming. And it, it says the ministration and the, the ministration of death, reaching and engraving his toes was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Which glory? Ministration of death. Which glory? The law of Moses. Which glory? The old covenant was to be done away. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, How? shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that is, as Christ has come, and by the Spirit is revealed unto us, how will that not be more glorious than in verse 9? In verse 9, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory verse 10 for even that which was made glorious old testament old covenant law of moses had no glory in this respect by the reason of the glory that excelleth and then in verse 11 for if that which is done away was glorious much more that which remaineth is glorious it's talking about the glory that has now come which is what we have in christ romans chapter 8 looking at verse 3 romans chapter 8 verse 3 for what the law could not do the law was deficient because of the nature of the people, because of the carnality of the people, because of the fleshly acts of the people, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Then in verse 4, it says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in us. We receive Christ and then Christ lives in us and the life we now live in the flesh we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. He lives on the inside of us and then we'll walk by his light, we'll walk by his life, and we'll walk by his faith and we'll live the victorious life because he abides 
in us. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, the purpose of the schoolmaster in focus. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterward be revealed. It says, before faith came, before Christ came, and before we had real faith in Christ, we had the law. We were shut up under the law. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That word schoolmaster, schoolmaster in the understanding of the Greek people was not the head teacher, the headmaster, or the proprietor. Those days, parents will have servants. Those servants will take the children to school. And the children, if they don't want to go to school, and they're screaming and crying, that servant will lay hold on them. He was referred to as the schoolmaster. He'll take them to school and force them to get to school. He was not the teacher. He was not the instructor. He was just the servant or the slave that will take that child and take that child to school. What he's saying is the law was the schoolmaster to convict us and to pinch us, to condemn us, to say, you went wrong that way, you went wrong that way, you went wrong that way. All the law is doing is acting as a schoolmaster to lay hold on our hand and to bring us to Christ. That law, that schoolmaster cannot save us, cannot give us assurance of salvation, cannot set us free, cannot instruct us in the way of righteousness, the schoolmaster was just to bring us to Christ through conversion, sends us on our knees with conviction, and then we pray, and Christ himself, the Savior, not the schoolmaster, the Savior now saves us from sin. Look at that verse 24 again. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Number two, the sons that believe and become God's children. Number three, the sign of truly becoming truly belonging to Christ. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Already we've read, um, let's look at that again, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed 24 wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto christ that we may be justified by faith until we come to christ we cannot be justified by faith if we are just with the schoolmaster what the law, what the commandments, we cannot be justified by faith. It is when that commandment convicts us, drives us to Christ as Savior, and that schoolmaster, the law, brings us to Christ, the justifier that we can now be justified by faith. Verse 25, in verse 25, but after that faith is come, after that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer under a schoolmaster. After that child in the Greek culture, 
at the first century after that child had been taken by the schoolmaster sorry by the um, school uh, master yes to school and sat down and is enjoying the teaching and now he wants the instruction he wants the teaching the schoolmaster is no more necessary because now that child has come to school and after we come to Christ Savior and we love him and we listen to him we enjoy his teaching we enjoy his life and we're now voluntarily wholeheartedly disciples of Christ and now we listen to him directly we don't need Moses anymore the greater one greater than Moses has come we don't need the lambs of sacrifice anymore the final sacrifice Christ has now come and we do not need any instructor of the priests of the Levites anymore Christ the greater one and the greatest one he has now come and we stay with him that's what he's saying after the faith is come we're no longer under a school master it tells us in Romans chapter 7 reading from verse 7 Romans chapter 7 reading from verse 7 what shall we say then if the Lord sin God forbid nay I had not known sin but by the law for I had not known and lost except the law had said thou shalt not covet look at verse 8 in verse 8 but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of evil of concupiscence for without the law without the law sin was dead verse 9 in verse 9 for I was alive without the law was but when the commandment came sin revived and I died. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, O wretched man that I am. That's what the law does. The law makes you to understand you cannot save yourself. The law makes you to understand your resolution, your determination, your turning over a new lead will not make any change. That's what the law does. It makes you to understand that in you there is no strength, there is no ability by yourself. As a man in nature, a woman in nature, there is no way you can obey the commandment of God by yourself you'll feel wretched you'll feel powerless and self and sin will dominate over you until the law holds your hand and brings you to Christ you'll be crying oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body from the body of this death the first part of verse 25 I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord the schoolmaster now brought me to Christ and I see is my Savior I see the one that can cleanse me and wash me whiter than snow is the one that can give me salvation forgiveness and freedom I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord I pray he'll do that in every life in Jesus name in Acts of the Apostle chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 38 be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin verse 39 in verse 39 but by him all that believe are justified from all things for which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses in him we have salvation we can't have that in Moses 
Through him we have forgiveness and redemption. We do not have that from Moses. It says all that believe in him, they are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Romans chapter 3 verse 19. In Romans chapter 3 verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. That's the office of the law. That's the essence of the law, is to make everyone in the world guilty in the sight of God. Verse 20, in verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, we are justified, we are saved, we are forgiven, we are redeemed through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the sacrifice of Christ, the provision of Christ. It is what Christ has done on your behalf, on my behalf, on our behalf, and we believe that that gives us the freedom, the forgiveness, the salvation, the redemption, not the law of Moses, but the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ. In verse 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, 25 says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, not faith in your own ability, Faith in your own, you know, confidence. Faith in self-confidence. It is faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. For the remission, removal, cleansing of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. And then in verse 26, we are sure to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Point number two there. Number two, the sons that believe and become God's children. The sons that believe and become God's children. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Not by obeying the law of Moses, by faith in Christ Jesus. What we couldn't have for ourselves, possess in ourselves, do in ourselves, Christ has done that for us. And now we become the children of God. God by faith in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them. Come out from 
the natural people, the Jewish people, the people that depend on their own strength and the people that depend on Jewish religion, on the people that believe or depend on the old covenant, come out from among them. The people that are still living in sin and they do not apply to Christ for salvation, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. Repent and turn away from every sin in your life let the schoolmaster bring you fully unto Christ and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you the Lord will receive everyone who comes in Jesus name in verse 18 and ye shall be and I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters says the Lord almighty and somebody shout amen. amen Romans chapter 8 we're looking at verse 14 Romans chapter 8 verse 14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God not those who are led by the law of Moses not those who are guided by the old covenant not those who are taken and they are being led by the ten commandments but now as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god in verse 15 it says for ye are for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father. And then in verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God who have repented, who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has come in. He has made a great change, a great transformation in our hearts. And the Spirit is bearing witness. We are being led of the Spirit. We are living now according to the pattern of the life of our Savior Jesus. Jesus Christ, we are the children of God. First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, before we get to heaven, we have to be the sons of God here before we go to heaven. That's the only condition that we come to faith in Christ and then our lives are transformed and we are changed. Now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And then in verse 3, it says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The Lord will purge you. He'll purify you. And he will make your life what he taught to be as children of God by faith in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. In verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Then in verse 6 it says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. For whosoever sinneth has not seen him is seen living in the old life of weakness, neither known him. In verse 7 it says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous in verse 8 it says he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god 
was manifested to come and do in us, to come and do for us, to come and do with us what the law of Moses could not do. The law of Moses could not change our person, our nature, our personality, our character. The law of Moses could not make us to walk in the way of the Lord. But now for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Then in verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God. God does not commit sin for they for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God we're reading verse 10 now in verse 10 it says in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God neither he that loveth not his brother. We'll come to number three. Number three here is the sign of truly belonging to Christ. The sign of truly belonging to Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 for as many of you as are baptized into Christ, not baptized in water, baptized into Christ, immersed in Christ, I in you and you in me, that the Father may be glorified in me. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Verse 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. If you have been baptized into Christ, immersed in Christ, Jew or Greek, the same. There is neither bond nor free, slave or master. If you have been baptized into Christ, you are the same. There is neither male nor female. Male saved, female saved, the same new life. It says, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. In verse 29, verse 29 says, and if ye be Christ, if you belong to Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We put on Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, Ephesians 4, Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now we can come to Christ. Our minds that were dirty, our thoughts that were dirty, our inner life that was dirty, we can come to Christ now and the blood of Jesus will wash us whiter than snow. Amen. Amen. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then in verse 24, it says, And that you put on the new man. Get rid of the old man. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's available for everyone. Everyone who comes, everyone who calls on him, everyone who believes on him, the Lord will take the guilt away, the condemnation away, the dirt away, and the impossibilities and deficiencies, take everything away, and he will give us his righteousness. And then we'll put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And through life, we'll be able to live in the strength and the power in the grace of the Lord righteous lives and when he comes to take his son away he'll take you away to heaven I said he'll take you away to heaven and you'll be with him forever and ever in Jesus name I'll be there I'll be there rise up and tell the Lord and say Lord here I am I come here I am I know what the law could not do Christ has come and Christ will do it in your life pray and believe by faith we enter him